Northeastern, this is totally fun. We're cooking remotely, but you can still drink wine remotely. So please imbibe if you do. I'm going to. Mm. No, allegedly it makes me have a better personality. But uh, Dave Martin, I think everyone's got that memo. Uh, I kind of wanted to give you a little bit about my background and then we're gonna like get cooking. We're gonna do a lot of fun stuff today. Uh, Dave Martin, in a nutshell. Uh, my story's different in that I was always into food and cooking and I love that. It wasn't my initial pursuit out of college. I ended up in the tech sector, made a ton of money, lost it all in 2000. I did a full reboot, went back to school, went to Port on Blue, landed on Top Chef. Went to New York for 13 years, got beat up, not physically, but every, financially and uh, every other way. But um, that was a great opportunity for me career-wise. Been doing a ton of consulting over the years of, you know, kind of what I've evolved into. I kind of created my own path. So in terms of cooking, like, I didn't want to just be in a restaurant. So over the last several years, I've been doing a lot of fast casual contacts. I did an Indian uh, I did a Georgia, as in Russia, not Georgia, Atlanta. Uh, I did an Indonesian, Malaysian, uh, Mexican. So my portfolio is pretty broad. Like I've got a great palate. I kind of cook from any region. Today we're kind of doing more what people knew of me on Top Chef, like Americana, da da da. Simple. You know, today our menu is going to be. You know, we're doing some great short ribs, but I'm going to show some quick some other techniques and faster ways to do it using the Instapot. That's kind of like my friend in the kitchen today, but you can still do it old school. We'll talk about both methods. We're gonna do a fire roasted tomato soup. Again, it's total comfort, but part of what I'm showing you guys today is not just that physical recipe. It's more about technique that you can roll into other things because today's menu isn't like hyper summer, hello, except for maybe the brownies that you can eat year round. Um, but it's more method and technique that I'm gonna be showing in a fun, interactive format. And last but not least, we'll be doing the brownies. So we've got the brownies, the soup, the short ones. So I digress. I kind of talked about my background, so blah, blah, blah. Now I'm in San Diego. That's why it's sunny and beautiful. I have a tan. Um, I'm losing weight as we speak because I'm back in California. Um, I eat a lot of rice cakes. Uh, no, but seriously, I still eat everything. Um, so let's get into it. So um, we're going to start with the brownies. Uh, so part of cooking is about organization and preparation. The cooking that's the easy part. It's the prep and organization that goes into it. Like even just this little class today is a couple hours of prep and setting everything up. So that's what's key. That's how you're successful is by preparing and organizing in advance. So we're going to start on the brownie, which sometimes say you're cooking for a group or whatever. Like you can bust your dessert out a day or two early, have that ready to roll and finish later, and then do the other things. If like the schedule's super busy or you're working or you just don't have time. Again, you can plan that accordingly, especially for like holiday meals, like Thanksgiving, like that's like a three or four day prep thing. So if you don't have the time, just roll things in ahead and then finish in the day up so it's not like so crazy the day up. Uh, all right, the brownies, you guys have the recipes and the ingredients. If I'm feeling like this is more of like people are watching versus doing it physically. So you can just watch and then implement these methods and techniques into your cooking when you try these at home. Um, another thing about recipes, recipes are a guideline, so you can modify and change, and edit, like if you don't like shallots, don't put them in the soup. Like with the brownies, I'm going to show you some things and we'll talk about some things that you can edit or add to, but kind of make it your own. When it comes to baking, that's a little more rigid. Uh, when it comes to cooking, that's a little more free, you know, free for all. Well, to a certain extent. Uh, so the brownies, one of the first things I'm going to do is kind of uh, we're gonna put some parchment down in the pan. Um, so if you just take parchment, this is like arts and crafts, which I'm not very good at. Um, just the cooking. So we're just gonna make the outline. This is gonna help it from sticking because it's like it's so buttery and gooey. It still kind of comes out, but this is like a double. It's a little extra insurance. And I'm kind of showing it so if you do cakes and other baking things, this is what we call, I like to give everything an acronym, SPS, spray paper spray. So the way you want to do it when you're baking at home is you spray. Paper. 
and spray. This reminds me of Live Live Lawn, the dance they did, but I, yeah, I'm going off. So spray, paper, spray, that's a great method so that when you pull it out, it not only releases the cake or brownie what's on the internal, but it also releases from the bottom by having that extra coat of spray. All right, so boom, there's that. Now, pretty simple, okay. Cakes and brownies, anything in that category, it's always about butter, so, Butter's always key, but the real secret ingredient to kind of, there are two, I'm gonna give you two things. One, veg oil or corn oil. A little bit of that to the recipe is gonna actually give you extra moisture, uh, or you can use applesauce, things like that, but butter's great, but butter can dry more so that oil, so when you have a cake that's like super rich and delicious and moist all the way through, there's a couple things probably happening. One, they're making a little oil, a lot of time. As you see in this recipe, it's a very small amount of oil, that helps to retain the moisture after the baking process. And then the other thing is when you have a tiered cake, what we normally do in the bake shop is we make a syrup, flavored syrup, whatever flavor, and we paint each level of the cake, and then you frost each level. So there's a couple things happening. There might be a little veg oil tucked in with the butter. And then secondly, in a layered application, is having those syrups to kind of keep it all super moist, which is key. No one wants a dry cake or a dry cupcake or brownie. So that was the first tip I was gonna give you on that was a little bit of oil, not a ton. It should be veg or corn, no canola. Like that is not, no, that's like done in a lab. You don't want that. So canola, if you have in the cabinet, throw it out along with your ionized salt. We'll talk about salt later. Um, another thing that all through baking, uh, it was always unsalted butter, unsalted butter. And I get that. And that is normally what I do in all of my other cooking. But the latest thing I've been doing the last year or so is actually using salted butter in my baking and still doing the same amount of salt. I mean, I don't want to float and have like a salt attack, but actually the unsalted butter in baking just adds that little extra edge in a cake, cookie, brownie, cupcake. Like there's just like a little secret and it's actually great. If you're salt free, like don't do that. But if you can still have a little more salt, the salted butter in baking is kind of, uh, it's working for me right now. So we've got, we're gonna do a traditional, this is known as a creamy method. So it's a butter cake, any of those things. We've got the butter that we got at Room Town. It's like really at Room Town. Just wanna drop that into the KitchenAid, or if you don't have a KitchenAid, that's all good. That old school hand mixer works great. There's butter on my arm. Uh, then I have sugar, brown sugar, and salt. I put this in the pan this morning. Sorry. Okay. So we've got the butter, sugar, and salt. I'm going to put the butter on my arm. We're just going to bring that together real quick. So in the creamy method, kind of what that means in terms of technique. Oh, the little veg oil or corn oil. You're just wanting to kind of bring it together, and what happens with the butter is as it becomes more whipped, the color changes to more of like a pale yellow, closer to white. That's kind of what it's just looking for. And this would be kind of trying to uh, integrate everything. I mean, you kind of see, I mean, the butter is typically very yellow, so as we start to whip it, the color changes a bit. So I'm going to go a little bit longer. We're going to next integrate the egg. What I like to do with my eggs, whether I'm baking or making pasta or any application, is I take the eggs separately and I actually just kind of whisk them together. Uh, you know, sometimes recipes will say drop one egg at a time, things like that. I just like to integrate it. That way it's already kind of pre-mixed as you go into your pasta or you go into your cake batter. I just find that, I don't know, it's just one of my, it's another one of my idiosyncrasies or things that I use when I cook at home or cook in a restaurant. Um, just like using only sweet onions and roasted garlic only, which I'll talk about when we get more to savory. So then I'm gonna just integrate the egg. But again, it's already like kind of pre-mixed, so it just kind of will go in more nicely. I'll just kind of whip that for a sec.
Is everyone good? Is everyone having a good time, I hope? Dave, there was one quick question. All right. Second. I have my cocoa and uh, all-purpose flour. I'm just going to sift that. Sifting is a very important technique. You can sift everything anytime you want. This just helps, helps to lighten and aerate the flour and the cocoa in this instance. And in terms of cocoa, there's all different brands. I mean, there's Sharpenberg, there's, I mean, we're using just simple Hershey's today, but I actually like, they have a special dark. I mean, the Hershey's I don't necessarily love all the time. I don't really like their chocolate, but I do like their cocoa. So uh, Hershey's special dark cocoa, it just gives you a little bit more depth, a little more richness. Next, I'm gonna do a little vanilla into the egg and the cream sugars. Yes, vanilla's gone off the chart over the last year, like like quadruple in price. So if you can't, whatever, if it's not in the budget, that's cool. A really good uh, extract is fine. So um, just don't tell your friends. The question is the judges. So we kind of whip and integrate that egg. Then we're going to add the sifted flour and cocoa. Just in like important in section. Cocoa is a mess. Like if you ever spill it when I was in cooking school, I a 50 pound bag dropped from the top rack in baking and went everywhere and like I still have cocoa in my hair. Like it's something you just cannot eradicate. All right. Okay. And we're just lightly mixing it. Question. Yes. Question. Um. The recipe says melted butter, but melted and cooled butter, but it looks like. Use room temperature. I use room temp. You can use either. Yeah. And then we have another one. What about protein powder? Oh, sure. So that's exactly like what I was talking about. Thank you for the questions. Um, you can make this basic brownie, and then you can kind of do anything and throw anything into it. So uh, protein powder, chia seeds. You know. Uh, like healthy berries, like anything you want to put into it. This is just the basic for just like a really great uh, fudgy brownie. And I made just a, I made a baby portion of this, a little smaller. One sec, I'm just making sure it's mixed in there like it. All right. So then, Okay. All right, I'm not licking the batter, but I don't do it present day, even though sometimes I'd like to. Uh, so we've got the spray paper spray. I'm also gonna add, so let's, here's where I'm talking about modifiers, additions, things, edits that you can do. Uh, so I've got my, I think this is like a 60% uh, cacao chocolate, but I have, I have a bunch of dark chocolate M&Ms, I have a bunch of chocolate pearls and heat bar pieces. I mean, if you're a nut person, you can drop in some nuts. Really anything. Protein peri, uh, excuse me, protein powder, dried blueberries, kind of whatever you want. And then we'll just drop it in here. Scrape it off. Then just kind of layer that out and kind of smack it. But it's a real thick, rich, fudgy dough. Uh, okay, sorry, I got some into the cooking. I forgot you guys were here. But uh, 
one of the things I like about, uh, I forgot, I lost my track. One second. <laughs> one of the things I like about, Space. I'll get. I'll bring it back. Yeah. The question: What yes. size pan are you? Oh, what size? This is for a half. Okay. So here's the deal. This is one of my cheesecake uh, pans. It's like a springform pan. So typically, I'd use like an eight by ten or more of that, like square brownie pan or rectangular if you want a little thinner, like to have that brownie wriggle. Uh, but this is just like a small, medium sized springform. But I'm doing half of a batch, and so that's important too. Say you don't have like a household and you don't want to make this whole batch, you don't have neighbors you can give it to, you can just half it and it'll come out perfect. So I'm just making half and then I'll make my friends eat it later. Um, and then like I said, you can kind of put whatever I I think I said the rest of put some internal, put some chips, external. What was I going to tell you about chocolate? It'll come back. So I'm going to drop it in the appreciated oven. Here's the thing, if you never, if you don't know a temp on something, whether it's cooking or baking, you can always default to 350. That's kind of like 350. You're good. Okay? So brownies are in. Alexa, set a timer for 20 minutes. I've got Alexa here. Starting now. My personal assistant. She's right on the budget. Okay. All right, so we got the brownies going. Still struggling to remember what I wanted to tell you guys about baking, but I'll come up with it. All right, let me move this out of the way. We talked about the cocoa, we talked about the chocolate. Let's move this out of the way. Okay, so now we're gonna go to. Oh, I have a secret item. We're gonna switch over to savory and we're gonna switch over to the Instapot in terms of tools and devices for the kitchen. So I'm sure you guys have all heard about them. Everyone has them or will maybe get one at some point. Some chefs are like, like David Chang's like, oh, I don't like the Instapot. And I don't, I don't know how you can. Uh, I would never use a device in the kitchen if it didn't make something as good or better, you know, with a quicker method. And so that's kind of what this is all about is it does make it as good or better. And you've got, it's kind of like a convection oven for baking, right? You have the heat in the air. In this case, you have the heat and then you have the pressure. So when we're talking about braised short ribs, which you know one of the things we're doing today, think about it. Why wouldn't it be better? It's gonna pressurize all of those liquids and flavors and you know herbs into the meat versus like traditional braised that may take three to three and a half hours. I can do it in like 45, 50 minutes. So like it's kind of sweet. But I'll talk about old and new new method. Um, but instant pot, instant pot, but I call it instant pot, I don't know why. Um, so this is a secret item that I did in here early. Potatoes. Uh, these are just some Yukon Golds, and you can, this little rack comes with it. I didn't, this isn't a special thing that you have to order on Amazon. I, I never really use it, but I do what I'm doing, mashed potatoes. I just put the rack in, and you just put some water on the base, and you literally just drop the potatoes in whole, skin, whatever you want. If you have it loaded, 10 to 15 minutes on the steam feature. So a little water in the base, like maybe two inches of water, set the potatoes on the rack, 10 to 15 minutes, steam feature. Oh, so on the Instant Pot, so based on which model, you kind of have opened or closed. And that's what a lot of people get, even when I started, I mean, it's a, listen, it's a modern day pressure cooker, let's be clear. This isn't like a magical thing to start. This is what our grandmothers and stuff used with pickling, but that was the gnarly one. You sit on the stove top, don't do it right, it blows off, it blows your head off. So this is a lot safer and secure, and that's one of the reasons I like it. Um, but you have uh, air release or air where it retains it. Don't worry about switching this back and forth. For pretty much 95% of anything you're gonna do, you're gonna do it with closed, okay? So closed, if you just follow that, you're fine, and then you'll release the air later, but I kind of showed you that. So potatoes, about two inches of water, drop them in, 10 to 15 minutes on steam, let it hold for about 10 or 15 after, release the steam, and then I'm pulling the spuds out and I'm just adding a little uh, cream of butter. 
the cool part about this is versus when we do mashed potatoes in the in the pot with all the water and all that's all good but they get all like waterlogged right if you no matter how long you cook them so this you have it being pressurized then you have that little moisture that goes in the potato but it's not this like super wet uh it's just not this wet gushy potato that's just water so you kind of just you really get at the end of the day you get a much better uh, potato flavor so this is a bonus item for today this is what i'm going to use as my base for the uh short rib but great way to do potatoes like originally when i was kind of playing around with mashed potatoes in there i did a little butter and cream and cooked it in that which was fine but i kind of like this new matter new method better that uh it's just a drier potato and then i can add whatever moisture post along with uh some salt and pepper let's talk about salt and pepper is everyone good it's so weird to not interact sometimes i'm like hello hello um yeah. Drink some wine if you have it. Um, salt and pepper for just my house salt. I use just an I, I not I, I use kosher salt. Uh, even though it's processed, it's still better. The salinity level is low. I mean, I have pink Himalayan. I have all these different salts. Those, it's a different salinity, salinity level, and I prefer those for finishing or dropping in something at the end. But what's nice to kind of keep at home or in or in the professional kitchen is a blend of salt and ground pepper, fresh ground pepper. I just kind of keep that on hand. And uh, then you don't have to go, oh, this much salt, this much pepper. So like when I go to braise or sear the short rib, I can have my salt and pepper ready to go or throw it on some asparagus before you roast it with olive oil. But these are some quick, easy, yummy mash that um, aren't waterlogged. So that's your bonus item of the day, these mashers. Okay. Next. Now we're going to switch to the Instapot and I've got to bring this. It's like Food Network, but without all the support. I do actually have some people in the audience helping me. Okay. All right. Okay, three short ribs. We'll talk about the wine and the pairings as, as well. I'm just kind of trying to get things going and then I'll circle back. So Instapot, here's what's cool about it. Another great feature, um, aside from cooking faster and just being easier, is the cleanup. Because of the pressurization at the end of the day, like everything's kind of blown off the side. So you just, it's very easy cleanup. It has a saute function, which is pretty awesome. So when you're building a soup or like in the case of the short rib, we're gonna put a little oil down. So you have the saute function. So instead of like making a big mess, you can saute, sear, start everything in here and finish it. And then boom, it's easy, done, and super clean and super fast. So, okay. All right. Okay, so we left that saute for just a minute. Okay, here we go. So I've got some sweet onion, like I talked about. I really, I never liked onion. And then once I got in the corner school, I had to use it everything, which was fine. Um, but rolling out, I just made the choice to use sweet onion for all applications. I prefer the flavor. I don't, raw onion, I don't like it anywhere. And even with garlic, I like to roast all my garlic. So sweet onion and roasted garlic are two keys in any of my savory dishes. It just keeps everything more mellow where nothing is like overpowering in the case of the onion or the garlic. Like we've all been out and you know, you take a bite of raw onion or a bite of raw garlic and you're really like, boom, God forbid you're on a date. So um, I, there's no need for it in my book. Uh, so we've just got carrot, sweet onion, and celery, which is standard beer pot the French word for carrot, onion, and celery. Uh, so we're gonna get that going, sauteing. It will saute, but we don't really need to kind of cook that. Actually, what I'm supposed to be doing is stirring the meat. Okay, we have a question. Yes. Can you use poultry or seafood instead? 
Can you use what? Poultry or seafood. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, in terms of the Instapot, you definitely want to, it's great. You can cook anything in it, but in terms of like braising, braised items are going to be things like you would do like, you could do cut up a whole chicken and do it in kind of like this method so that it's great for things that take typically longer to cook. Seafood, seafood I wouldn't necessarily do it because you just don't need that extended cooking. This is kind of all about uh, breaking down the meat, you know, like a, a tougher cut of meat, like a shore rib or taking a uh, pork shoulder, uh, any of those tougher cuts, uh, it breaks them down. And same thing like with a whole chicken or chicken legs, chicken thighs with the bone in, you can kind of do this same kind of thing. So what I'm really supposed to be doing is searing this off, but I got ahead of myself and dropped in, dropped in the mirror fog, which doesn't matter, but technically you don't have to uh, sear it. Here off the bed, that is the mirror uh, okay, so, so this is up and running. Well, so we'll just tear this off. Now, some people, some chefs, again, everyone has different methods, different techniques. Some chefs don't tear, they just throw it in. And that works. It's fine. Just for me, I've always seared my protein before I put it into the uh, braise. Um, and that's, you know, you do what you want to do. I just like to know that I've got seasoning rolling in. And then as we go through, I, I retain more of the seasoning so I don't have to do it again. Yeah? Question, Dave. Um, can you discuss how you would do, like, how you would do the short rib without the instant pot? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. Oh, and you want to make it so you got cut of meat. I'm all squirrely. Um, the cut that I use is known as country short rib. So a lot of, again, chefs, they love the bone in, so they'll do the bone in short rib. I prefer the no bone. And so the country cut, country short rib, there's no bones, and you can just slice it up, throw it in. Um, some people will say, oh, yeah, the bone in is more flavor. I mean, yeah, maybe I'll taste it, but my palate's like, yeah. So that's a personal choice, but I enjoy the boneless. I just, I prefer. So this is a country style short rib is the name of the cut that I'm using in today's short rib. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. So let's talk about the regular method, which would be, uh, I have my, it's great to have a great dress up and some stuff, uh, which is a great American brand. I love using it. Uh, my friend at least, he sent me, it's great. Okay. So, and we're going to still talk about life. Okay. The method for the short ribs, old school method that I used to do forever. Uh, I would do the same thing that I'm doing now in terms of process where I would sear the meat in a pan on the stove top, okay? Salt, pepper, olive oil, Dutch oven or whatever, or just a regular saute pan. Then I would take a larger formatted, uh, A larger formatted pan, you know, hotel pan, and then you load all the veg at the base. Then you'll put your seared short rib on top of that with the fresh herb. Then you're going to add all your liquid. Uh, so it's really kind of the same, it's just a different vessel. I'd sear here, and since this is the Dutch oven, what's great about it, I can just sear in this. Then I can drop my veg in, drop all my liquids, my aromatics, all that stuff, put the lid in it, on it, excuse me, drop in the oven. If you're doing a small batch, like we're doing a very small batch of short ribs, I check it at two and a half hours. Uh, the more you cook, if you're cooking five, 10 pounds, you want that to go like three hours, check it at three. If it's still not breaking down, then you go about three and a half. So that's the old school method. It's the same kind of method and technique. You just don't, you can stop using this device on the back. Okay, so we've got, in terms of the steering, what I'm looking for is Basically, all sides have some brown because I kind of oh, the blocky in uh, your salt and pepper. So that's all kind of done. You do the same thing here. Then you would integrate your mirror plot and other ingredients. So we're going to drop in. This is some um, 
the carrot stock. I'm going to show you this brand if you don't know it yet. It's my favorite. Uh, and I'm not on the payroll. I just love their stuff. Uh, better than bullion. I don't know. The lighting is kind of bright. But better than bullion. They make a whole array of prepared stocks, they've got veggie, they've got roasted chicken, they've got beef, they've got lobster, they've got mushroom, all these great flavors, really clean, clean ingredients. When you read the label, there's not like 60 things. And it's not those containers on the shelf that say veggie stock or whatever, and it's like dirty water. Like you're better off using water. So for me, it's all about better than bouillon. These all actually have flavor in them. They're not super sodium driven. They have a reduced sodium line as well but really great flavors to take your soups and sauces to the next level without having to like, you know, not that making stocks is a pain, but like if you don't have all the extra space and storage, it can be a lot. So these are, if you get nothing out of today, uh, better than bouillon, that's a great tip. You have to take it. So we have all this sear. Um, did I say sherry was supposed to go in or that's my soup? Okay, I'm good. Uh, so I put my stock in. I'm just putting um, this really great Malbec that I love. Uh, some of the wines that I mentioned today are the Row 11 wines from my friends at Row 11, great wines. Um, you know, pairing is, for me, I was always a California Oregon Pinot guy and I still love those. But modern day, I think it's from my time in New York, I definitely love the Malbecs and the Italian Reds, you know, the Nebbiolos, all those great things. It's just so, I just kind of like the dustiness and the clay. Uh, we're going to do fresh herbs. That's always critical. We're going to drop in a little bit of oregano. We're just throwing that in there, uh, as well as some garlic. Roasted typically, but I just have some raw here. And then I'm saving these items for when we make a sauce. Last but not least, to me, this is what I call just a standard, typical, I would call this just a French breaks. So you've got garlic. You've got the tomato paste, which helps to work as a thickening agent later when we go to like making a quick sauce from the braising liquid. Okay. So we've got everything in, right? Lock it down, air locked in, and then I'm just gonna hit meat. Oh, wow. Meat stew. So for this, I would do 45 to 50 minutes. So it's gonna go, I always shut off the key form function if it's on. Then it's gonna go. We're gonna stop, I've already made some, so I'll show you that later, but that's kind of the process. We're gonna let that go, and I'm gonna show you how to make a pan of sauce. Once that's cooked a bit. How's my timing, where are we at? You're at 1237. Okay, 1237. Okay, brownies are in, let's check those. Something that's important is whenever you're baking, if you don't, you do or don't know your oven, it's great to kind of, whether it's cake, cookies, anything, I always kind of rotate. I, my, I may rotate one or two times more for a cake, cookies, at least one rotation. It helps so if your oven isn't baking evenly all the time, it will help give you more even bake. Okay? All right. Any other questions while I kind of move on to the next thing? Um, how long do you cook the brownies? Cook the brownies. Okay, so this is a great question for chefs because they'll say, oh, how long do I cook? So ovens and stuff always have variables. I think I normally would do like, well, we're timing this at like 25 to 350. It could be 25 to 35. Um, it just is really going to depend on the pan size and everything that you're using. Like chefs never want to give you a real answer because we don't know your oven. We don't know the time. We don't know if it's working the same as where we may have originally done it. So here's my, here's how I would troubleshoot a recipe when you're going to bake it. Let's say it says, I think mine's, this says 25 to 35 minutes or something. Start at like 20, um, maybe do a rotation in the middle and then kind of see where you're at. Flip it again, maybe go another 10. But here's the thing with baking. You can never go back in time. So it's always better to kind of go less and then you can go more later. And also know just like in anything you're cooked, whether it's meat or anything on the stove top, you have carryover cooking. So same thing in baking. When you bake something, say it looks perfect. If it looks perfect and you test it with the toothpick, get it out of the oven because when it sits, it's gonna keep cooking. You know, it's been at 350 or whatever the temperature, so it's gonna continue cooking. So you don't want it. If it looks perfect, pull it, it's gonna cook longer. 
is the point of that. Did that answer that question? I think so. So kind of use the time as a guideline and build as you need to. Okay, we yes. have another question regarding yep. the ribs. Yes. Um, what do you use in the short rib if you don't have sherry? Oh, so if you don't have sherry, okay. So um, again, this is very French. Uh, the sherry is very French. If you don't have sherry, for me, it's all about the fortified wines. Sherry, Marsala, you know, those are all great because they, you know, it's a different process that goes through. So this flavor remains kind of through the dish, even when you've cooked it. But if you don't have sherry or anything fortified, you can use whiskey, you can use tequila, you could use any other spirit that has some type of flavor that, and if you don't have it, ultimately, it's okay that you don't have it. Like, that's just a French thing. To me, that just adds a little bit more flavor at the end. Um, but it's not hypercritical. So you can get around it, but you could use whiskey or anything else that kind of has flavor. Uh, you could do a white wine braise. The difference with white wine versus red wine, when you cook it down, um, or even like when you're doing it with mussels, I would use something, a Sauvignon Blanc, a Chard, something that's got a little more flavor on the get-go, because at the end, that white wine really dissipates and you really lose a lot of the flavor. So that's why, we, in cooking, we use a lot of the fortified wines as we do the deglaze um, to bring out future flavor. Okay? Okay. I'm back. All right. So this is going da -da, We're going to the soup. Alexa, stop timer. Alexa, set a timer for 10 minutes. So we're going another 10. 30 now. Thank you, Alexa. Anytime. She, oh, stay there. Have a good She's, afternoon. Oh, you too. <laughs> See, she's on the payroll. Here's the sherry. So, this discussion is kind of all about soup. One of my favorite things. I think to me, a sign of uh, a good chef is one that can make great soups and sauces. So, I think that I can. I've heard I can, but uh, we'll see how it works today. All right. So I'm going to turn stovetop on, stove on to like medium high to high heat to get it all warm. Just a little olive oil, extra virgin. Uh, you know, in terms of oils, we talk a little about salts. Same thing with oils. There's so many great oils out there based on what you like or what you want to do in terms of imparting flavor. We talked about the veg and the corn oil for baking a little bit. Uh, also for vinaigrettes, or not vinaigrettes, excuse me. Dressing like a Chinese chicken salad dressing, uh, Caesar salad dressing. Uh, olive oil is too powerful. So uh, for my Chinese chicken salad dressing, I use a corn oil, which just imparts a great flavor and the viscosity is awesome. Same thing with uh, what's kind of dressing uh, stuff for? But that works as a great neutral base. Oh, I use it in my Caesar. So I use it in my Caesar in that. Um, it's my preferred, it's corn oil for that, those applications. So I'm gonna be using the better bouillon roasted veggie stock, which is so awesome. Okay, so I'm getting this can going. Mm. Soups, okay. Any soup that I make, it's pretty much the same construction. It's just the, the signature ingredient is the only difference. So you can take the same base and make any soup, from asparagus, I mean, clam chowder is a little different, but uh, really any kind of soup just starts with the core ingredients, which for me, again, and it, traditionally in, in French and classic cooking, uh, we've got some sweet onion, some celery. Oh, also, these celery uh, fronds, use them. They're great. They actually have a little bit different flavor, so don't throw those in the garbage. So we've got the sweet onion, carrot, celery, shallot. That's very French. And I've got some roasted garlic that I'm dropping in here. Uh, Oh, the soup base. So, really starting with this vegetable platform, this is what we're going to really want to caramelize and reduce. And I'm going to show you. We want to really kind of build the flavor there. And then it's just about adding the next ingredient, which in this case, tomato is the highlight or the signature of this. But if it were, I do this for my asparagus soup. I cook this down, I throw in my asparagus, roast it, drop that, blend it. You know, we're using some cream today, but if you can't do cream, the, the, the secret on that is oat milk. If you haven't tried oat milk, 
They actually have a no sugar oat milk that's out now that is delicious and it has the best viscosity. I use that for puddings and other cream sauces for clients or friends that don't do dairy. It's, a, it's the best alternative. It's better than almond and everything else. It's really the number one, um, and that's oat milk. Uh, again, the viscosity is so much different. So, so any soup, we've got carrot, onion, celery, shallot, roasted garlic. If you don't like garlic, you don't have to put it. And then whatever herb is going to pair best with it. So like if I do a cauliflower soup, I might use fresh pine. For my butternut squash, I use sage. Uh, so kind of, I always try to have uh, an herb that works best with that. Typically, the soups I make primarily are vegetables, not that I don't do any stone cut, like with bacon fat on the base, but we've got that fresh herb. So we're gonna caramelize this, get this going. You can use normal oil if you need to. It's great to have in squeeze bottles. Seriously, squeeze bottles are, they're green. The, uh, we've got fresh basil we're throwing into this. And they're kind of like I said, some chefs don't like this, some don't like that. Some don't do herbs on the front end. I do the herbs on the front end. I like them to kind of get in and cook down. You can still taste them. Um, it's just a preference and how you want to do it. If you're like, hey, that's stupid, then that's fine. You can add them at the end or whatever you like. But it's very important to have that fresh herb. It really brings it all together. Um, you know, like the oregano that I use for the short ribs, you can use pine, but fresh. I don't, I don't have any dry herbs. Like, I don't know what that is. So it's really all about the fresh. It does make a difference. Uh, you maybe use a little more in, in terms of fresh versus dry, but it, it's a game changer for your final product. I'm gonna cut the brownie. They're cooking, they're baking. I'm gonna check my wine. Okay, how's everyone doing? We're cooking this down. We've got the front ribs going, the brownies in the oven. Any other questions while I start to work on this thing? We have a question from the Yeah. Okay, so would you order the brownies separately or would you have to have a traditional like, uh, like the traditional way like, like that's Yes, the question from the audience uh, is, we do have a live audience here. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, in case no one showed up, at least I had my friends here, but um, you know, do I prefer the Instapot versus the traditional method? And for sure, like, I like it. Here's the deal, you can do, you can do the short ribs. If I had two, I actually now do my sweets in the Instapot, and it's the same thing, I turn on the saute feature, I would be doing this, you know, caramelization in here, and then dropping it all in there, the same method as the stove top, but the cleaner and faster. So like for the soup method of the tomato soup, caramelized everything just like I'm doing here in the Insta, then I drop everything in, whether it's oat milk, all the other goodies, 10 minutes, that's how long. So it's really quick. Then I release the air, pull it out, immersion blend, which we'll get to later on both the sauces and the soup. And then uh, you're good to go. But it's just, I don't know, I've just found a real affinity for it. Uh, you know, baking, seven minute cheesecake, you can do your puddings in this. Do I sound like an infomercial? It's kind of gross. Um, but your braised meat, your soup, uh, I make salsas, like I did this taquerita salsa down here that I love. I just roast, I drop in my dry chilies and uh, garlic, I caramelize that, I drop in the liquid, I turn it on for 10 minutes of steam and I blend it. like. It just is a great, it's such a great tool for saving time, but not, <clears throat> I would never discount the flavor. So. Just to save time, you know, that doesn't make sense. So you definitely want, I want it to be as good or better. Like why well, could give you the brain stronger this way or that way. And you're not gonna taste the difference. Or if you do, it's not gonna be, it's the top version is not, not as good. Again, you've got that pressure and that heat, just like when you do convection oven with the heat and the airflow, keeping everything for I just use convection for everything. Uh, so if you have that feature, not just baking, it's just a better overall even cook. And then set the brownie. 
Is amazing. So if you're dairy free, it's gonna change. It's gonna change your life. You can use it in anything: soup, sauces, whatever, baking. Uh, so here's the cherry, which I was supposed to do earlier, but whatever. I'm sidelined. Um, the term to glaze, you're basically just releasing everything from the pan. It's, it's not about. And if you're someone that doesn't break that tool, like and cherry is not something that's gonna get you buzzed. Same thing with if you didn't want to add the wine and you don't have any wine or you want to drink it and not cook with it, you can just do this with the stock braids. You don't have to add the wine. The wine is just to give it a little more flavor, but all the alcohol is going to cook off in all these applications. So if you test the alcohol or you don't drink, you, by no means, you don't have to use that. Normally, I do put the lid on because it helps arm more faster, but, you know, whatever. I'm off my game. It's been a rough couple of months. No, um, I, I digress. Anyway, so, okay, we're talking about, we've got some things, we talked about better than bouillon. We talked about having, you know, having kosher as your main staple, but having the other salts that are great to finish with because they're just more powerful. Um, let's see. Alexa, stop timer. Still need more time. What time is it physically? Physically, it's twelve fifty-one. Oh my gosh. Okay. And we have another present from the audience. Okay, great. Okay, would you prefer to use the bouillon as opposed to chicken stock that you could buy in the store? Like the, is that a better method? Yeah, the better than bouillon is the the solution for okay. all stocks. So you would not use chicken stock, like you know those. Yeah, we talked. Yeah, no, none of the cans or boxes. Yeah, we said we. Yeah, ready, set, no. Those are out. All they right. have no flavor. They're just like dirty water. Okay, so this is good and caramelized, and we do glaze with the cherry. So now we can go ahead and add in this case cream. But if you're no dairy, oat milk is going to be your new uh, best friend. I I do it in my coffee and everything. Tomatoes. I think it says San Marzano, but I just have, I've got all kinds of tomatoes. This is uh, Cento. This is just a real standard brand they have everywhere. They're actually, it's a great uh, neutral tomato. And then I have, Muir Blend is typically what I use. Hunts has fire roast as well. Uh, but I, I like the blend of the two. And you can, like I said, it's any tomato, you guys. Like, if you don't like fire roast or you can't find that, whatever tomato, just use those same ratios. Nowadays, I do drop a little water in because I'm cleaning out the cans for recycling. So I want to get every kind of no waste person. So I want to get as much of the tomato product as possible. So we just kind of drop all that in. And again, this will be the same method if you were instapotting it. You would drop everything in, give everything a stir. Up real quick and then we'll blend it. Okay. Let me just clean up for a second. Okay, we talked about oils, we talked about salts. I'm circling back to see what we talked about. Oh, so let's talk about some kitchen devices and tools. Everyone always asks about uh, you know, what's your favorite knife, what's your favorite pan, blah blah blah. The knives that I use are Messermeister. Uh, just I use them in culinary school. I still have my original set, but um, German steel, great, affordable. It's not overpriced. Great knives. They've got all kinds of fun handles, whether it's walnut or olive wood. But just a great brand. Uh, Female-owned company. I'm friends with them. I became friends because I just was like, I love you guys. And they're like, oh great, let's send you some more knives. But I do love the knives because of that. I paid for my first set, but really great knife. Uh, out of Germany, but they operate out of uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, so that's nice. Pots and pans. Again, everyone's like, oh, what pots and pans, blah, blah, blah. 
buy what you can afford. Just because you have a thousand dollar pan, if you can't cook, you can't cook. So um, get what you can afford. If you can afford all that, great. But that doesn't mean it's the best. Like you have to be able to have a little technique to bring to the pot or pan in order to make something delicious. So get what you can afford and, and just make it work. Uh, some other gadgets. Uh, one of my favorite, this is like, I have one in my bedroom. The uh, <laughs> immersion blender. It's just so great for soups, sauces. Like I'm gonna use it twice here in a minute. I'm gonna take this soup and blend it. And I'm also gonna blend this sauce that we're gonna create from the braised liquid, uh, from the short rib. But part of what's better about it than a blender is like, if you're putting that hot liquid in a blender, when you eat it, it expands, like I've seen them blow up, like, and it's not good. It's like the pressure cooker with grandma. So you want to just eliminate having anything dangerous happen in the kitchen and the immersion blender is just like boom you take it off you rinse it i mean it's the best 40 bucks you're ever going to spend if you're a cook but you guys probably know that if you're cooking already um the other thing that you know a little fancier uh you know the immersion circulator uh so it's in that same category it's sous vide you know it's what you use for that but these are great gourmet has a great brand brand i think amazon bought them at like 100 bucks these are great for, you know, you can cook meats and such, but what I like doing is puddings and custards and creme brulees. I put them in little jars and I do 176 for 60 minutes. It makes the perfect creams and custards because you're just at one temperature the whole time, not dealing with water baths. Individual cheesecakes, you can do that all with this. So I kind of use this more for desserts. Or if I've got an event and I have no ovens, I can make everything and bag it and turn jacuzzis on their food safe and drop all my food in bags. So it's great for events. For me, this is for events and puddings. I don't necessarily like cook my steak at like four degrees for six days and take it out and sear it. Like I don't have time for that. So, uh, but for other applications, a great device. This is number one. Salt, garlic, talk about sweet onions. Yes. Can you repeat the name of the knife set? Oh yeah, it's Messermeister. M-E-S-S-E-R. N-E-I-S-T-E-R. But great knives, and, and oh, on that topic of knives, you don't need 26 knives. You need like three or four great ones, a serrated, a chef knife, you know, maybe a carry knife, but like three or four knives, so don't worry about, you know, it might look good that we'll start as a set of like 800 knives for $46, but you don't need them. Three or four core knives, that's really kind of all you need. Um, Oh, you know what? I have this too, so I'm just putting a little bit of hot sauce in there. It'll just kind of bring out the tomato. I think in the recipe it says, you know, a little hit of sugar or something, which is fine. That just kind of, is kind of help with the acid. So if it's very acidic, or you're just kind of, you're tasting it, it's just like so, uh, you can put a little hit of sugar. You're going to, you're going to always want to season at the end as well of any dish that you're cooking. Uh, season at the end versus I put herbs in the beginning, salt and pepper, that's kind of always at the end. And I do grind my own fresh pepper. It's just better because spices in a jar, like, especially if you don't cook, they just sit on the shelf. Um, what else can I talk about? Did I put in the veg salad? No. And so, like, I'm cooking on an electric stove, like, they're like, oh, what do you prefer? Whatever I got. So, if I've got gas, great. That would be the preferred, but if I only have electric, you just gotta make it work. It's the same thing. Like, if you can't cook on gas, just because it's gas doesn't make you any better. Like, you've gotta know what you're doing. So, that soup is kind of up and running. Put a red on this. I'm gonna pull it out anyway, so it doesn't matter. Brownies, those are cooking. We're at one, but we have a little time, right? Uh, I think he has it till 1.30, so is anyone getting squirrely? Is everyone all right? I'm gonna... I have some finished product here, so I'm going to... I'm gonna release the air. I'm gonna make a sauce. I've already got some squirrels, so I take it earlier. Been good for a while. Okay. 
Well, that's happening up to you. So I'll turn the heat off. But a great Dutch oven. This is Staub. They're made in the US. Um, they're a little less than a liquor set. Same quality. They're made in Appetite. There's another brand for cast iron and related products called Lodge, which is also American based. They're even less. So based on your budget, you have what you can afford. Um, but Staub great. Lots of sets great if you go to the outlet store. Or they send you some free stuff. So we're just going to blend this with the emerging blender. Yeah. Uh, you talked about oil, vegetables, more. Oh yeah. Why not canola? Okay. Let me let's go back to oils. One sec. Let me finish this blending. So oils. Um, yeah, canola. Like that's made in a lab. That's not even like there's not a canola plant. So. That's what kind of freaks me out about it. Kind of like a lestra. If you remember those chips in the day, they had that oil, it was like a fake oil that wasn't good if you ate too many chips. Google it if you don't remember. But um, in terms of oil, there's so many others. You've got avocado oil, which is great for vinaigrettes. You've got Spanish and Greek olive oil. You know, every region, just like amazing grapes, they have different types of uh, oils, just like the wine. So that's awesome. There is also, uh, if you want something to Peanut oil, sesame oil, those are things that peanut oil is great to fry in. You know, duck fat is another great method. Um, there's another oil, it's uh, called Thrive, T H R I V E. It's actually an algae oil. So they've created an oil from algae. So it's super clean, has a great high heat point, uh, very neutral flavor. So, like, if you have issues with fats and things like that, Thrive is really kind of the best, along with like, the avocado, is really nice. Um, and it doesn't make anything taste like avocados, it just happens to be the oil. Uh, so that's kind of my oil trap. But yeah, canola, gross. Um, yeah, don't do anything with it. Except throw it in the trap with the iodized salt. Okay. Dave, yes. you olive oil and you use the brownies. You can totally use olive oil and brownies. Um, you know, the for me, if I was going to, I'd want to make sure that I kind of have one that has like a little fruitiness or something, maybe like I was just talking about the Greek or Spanish might work better than uh, kind of like that, you know, traditional, like robust, just standard EVO that you buy on the shelf. But I would try to find something that has, you know, a little bit more uh, fruity or herbal flavor. But yeah, you can totally do it. And again, some of your guests may not even know. So we're pretending this is done. More importantly, I'm going to show you how to do this sauce. Here's the soup, but can you see it? It's still a bit I can't. Yeah, I mean, here it is. So I, I already pre made some. It's just kind of hard to go at that angle, but it's super clean. I kind of like it textured. You can blend as long as you, you can blend all day if you want to get it more refined. I do like a little bit of the texture and the chunk. Um, and then with soups, here's the thing. Like, make the full batch. Or the batch that I have maybe seems too large, you can break it in half. But even then, you can give some to the neighbors and you can take it and freeze it. Certain things, I I'm not good at making small batches of sauces, small batches of soups, like small batches of brownies, yes. But the other stuff, you're going to make the mess. Make the same mess and save it for later is kind of my mantra in that case. Um, because it just, Honestly, making super small batches sometimes, uh, it just doesn't work. So just make a big batch and use it. Okay. okay another quick question. Yeah. Um, you had to create the soup, correct? Correct. Yes, the button, the button. Uh-huh. Correct, correct. Thank you. Right. So what's great about braising is You have this amazing liquid that you put, in this case, all of the mirepoix, the wine, uh, the sherry. We'll pretend that I put it in even though I spaced it. Um, okay, so I'm going to pull on the meat. Here's some that I did earlier today. 
just because I didn't have the full time to go through it with you. So it's like Food Network, but like the, the format version with no staff. Okay. Okay. So just like I used the immersion blender on that, here's some more great tips. We can just make a super easy, delicious sauce with your braising liquid. It has all the veg and stuff. Basically, it's like a soup, kind of, right? Because it is kind of the same construction. You can strain the veg out. Okay, if you want to be more refined, you can strain the veg and then heat this back up. But I like, again, I like texture and flavor. So I'm going to blend all the veg in and kind of have like this meat, red wine sauce with veg. I'm going to do that. Then to finish the sauce, a little acid is always critical. So I have a little fresh citrus. Oh, and P.S. the stuff that says real lemon or real lime, that's not. So this is actually real. Don't buy into that stuff. People are like, oh, no, but it's real. Like, it's not. Please. It's kind of like Tropicana. That's not orange juice. Just saying. That's like one orange and they put it in a bag with a bunch of water. But that's another story, that's like another class. So um, a secret ingredient that I use, I'm not into uh, roux. Uh -huh. um, no, but I really don't like roux. I don't put flour in my cooking. I don't just add flour when you're baking, yes. But in thickening sauces or soups, I don't ever do that. Unless it's a gumbo and that you have to do it. But even then I don't do it, to be honest. I use either potato starch or rice flour. They're both gluten-free and they're both uh, amazing. And I just mix it with a little your olive oil and butter. Do 50 50 ratio. So it'd be like a tablespoon of butter, tablespoon of potato starch or rice flour. You add that to your super sauce that you're attempting to thicken. It works like a flour, but it doesn't add any glue. Um, you want to heat it up to kind of cook it off. Uh, but it will help thicken uh, your sauce. So, like for this pan sauce, you'll just throw that in, heat it up real quick, and it'll give you a little bit more. Uh, It'll tighten up and thicken up for you. Which we're gonna pretend that I did that. I mean, I did it, but you know, our time is our time. So, okay. Everybody's good. So, we did the soup, we finished that. Then we're gonna wanna hit it with salt and pepper. Give it a taste. Also, with soups and sauces, if you make them the day before, that's fine, but you're gonna to wanna to readjust the salt and pepper the next day, okay? Every day, it's gonna change because everything kind of settles. So when something's super hot, then it cools. Even if you season it properly, it's gonna change the next day, so that's very important to double check it before you serve it. Always taste everything before you serve your guests, okay? Uh, this, we're gonna do, we did that super uh, quick, easy, uh, really potato-driven mashed potatoes in the Instapot. Then we have, so here's some of the short ribs I did earlier, but you'll see it just is falling apart, like perfect, great. It's a little settled because it's not hot right now. We've got that. We talked about doing this quick, easy, basically almost like a pan sauce that we made from our bracing liquid. And you hit that with a little salt and pepper as well. And then let me taste it. Delish. So that's quick, easy, great short rib. Now, if you did it in the oven, no problem. You pull it from the oven, remove your meat, same thing. Then take your liquid, put it in a vessel that's going to be secure for you, and then give a blend and finish with your acid and all the other things like we talked about. All right. Any other questions? No? Let's see. Nope, no other question. Okay, we talked about knives, we talked about pans, we talked about soda crops, we talked about oils, we talked about alternative dairy, we talked about wine and cooking, we talked about fortified wines, um, we talked about some, we talked about better than bouillon. What else? What else does anyone have a question about? So you mentioned something about bone-in versus, like, you prefer to cook without the bone. Yes, that was a question about bone-in or 
or non-bone. Right. Because I've always been told like if you have the bone in, it's more flavorful. Yeah, it is allegedly, but I don't think to the general public. I, I think if I made you bone in versus bone out, you might be like, oh, I don't really taste it. So okay. it does add the marrow and things like that. So these brownies look they're like super fudgy and rich and like gooey. You can throw in whatever you whatever you like, like we talked about, whether you want nuts, berries, mm -hmm. other items. Mm. Delicious. We also covered dropping in that salted butter versus just regular unsalted for baking applications only, which does kind of elevate that flavor a bit. So we did the soup, which I kind of did in the stovetop method. I talked about we could do it in the instant pot as well. We did the short rib, we did the secret bonus recipe of the potatoes with just the water at the base, 10 to 15 minutes, bone, little butter and cream, salt and pepper. We took the short ribs, we turned that into a braising liquid. The other cool fun thing there was the potato starch or rice flour with a little butter, olive oil, 50 50 ratio to give you that paste that will thicken. Um, yeah, so we got soup, we got short ribs and potatoes. And we got a little killer fudgy brownie with that little veg oil, or if you want to use olive oil, go for it. Yes. Um, how far advanced can you keep the potatoes ready if you make it beforehand? Like for a party, you can make it on Monday and serve it on Friday. Like you're good. It's it's gonna hold. It's gonna be fine. Like I said, just take it and reheat it and um, adjust the seasoning post. So I think. That's kind of all I've got in this quick impromptu. Well, I knew it was happening, but it seems impromptu. Um, little cooking session for you guys today. I hope you got some great tips and tricks that you can implement. And, you know, like I said, we talked about soup and turning that any way you want with the different core ingredient. And yeah, I hope everyone got something from this. Matt? All right, thank you so much, Dave, for a wonderful cooking class. Uh, I hope everyone here was able to enjoy. Oh, we have a little bit of feedback here. Yeah, turn uh, I think we might be able to be, we fix that now? Okay. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we'll be sending out a survey. So feel free to fill out that survey to let us know how you enjoyed the event. Um, but I hope everyone was able to get some great cooking and uh, get to the kitchen and cook these meals for everyone here. So thank you so much, Chef Dave. Thank you.